Thank you so much, Prabhat. And I think the the important thing here is that DHIS2, it's 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 not really about DHIS2, it's about the ecosystem around it. And I think Dr. Knut tomorrow will also come back to his presentation to show us a little bit about it's the community, it's the resources, everything is open in the really true sense of the word, um, and the local capacity building that we've been speaking about this morning as well. So I think that's important to, to continue to reiterate. So I would like to move us into the next presentation by Mrs. Monica Amua. So Monica has been working with HISP Uganda, in, uh, based in Kampala, um, for many years, and she is the EMIS lead uh, within HISP Uganda. In addition, we're really excited that Monica is currently a PhD student at the University of Oslo, so we have the privilege of really finding out from her what is happening on the ground in the work that she's doing, but also the reflections that she has from her, her PhD. And I think it's the most beautiful co uh, connection between thinking through, reflecting, theorizing, and bringing that to practice in the everyday use of how do we move into decentralizing and empowering our district officials in the different countries that we work. And there's so much to learn from, from health. So Monica having the experience from health, I think that also brings a lovely reflection into the education sector. So Monica, I welcome you up to the stage. Please well, help me to welcome Monica with some applause. And it's number four. Thank you very much, Sophia, for the warm welcome. Good afternoon to you all. Um, yeah, so like Sophia has mentioned, I'm sharing my experience both as an implementer and also a, as a researcher. So in Uganda, um, because of the flexibility of DHIS2 and the also understanding the context around uh, the country in which we are implementing, we focused more on aggregate data. Uganda, we have um, a national population of around 48 million uh, people, and uh, we have over 15 million learners in school. So uh, collecting individual data has its challenges and complexities. So the focus was really on how can we um, leverage the existing aggregate data to be more meaningful and also to be used at the subnational level. So our focus was on uh, decentralizing the education management information system and we are currently uh, implementing in four districts and we've established them as districts of excellence. So I think going back to the earlier discussions we had this morning and, um, and the trend uh, globally about decentralization, I think there's been um, a move in so many countries to decentralize uh, service delivery. So this is transferring authority, responsibility from the central level down to the uh, local lower level units. In our case, we call them uh, local government units in Uganda. And of course, the reason why we are really decentralizing is to improve um, effectiveness in service delivery, to avoid those bottlenecks the minister was talking about, the bureaucracies in decision making, so that at least what we are providing to the lower levels, to our learners, to the teachers, really has impact. So I think that is really the main aim of decentralization. And then at the central level, the focus then stays on how do we uh, obtain this data to inform the policies that we are making that will then be uh, channeled down to the lower level. So that is in the broader sense of decentralization. But when we look at decentralization in the education sector, I think this has been the most popular reform in education management, not only you know, in developing countries, but also developed countries in the Americas, in Europe. So, um, but when you look at research and uh, uh, the research on decentralization of our education sector, it has really focused on learning, on ensuring that um, 
we improve the teaching and learning outcomes at the lower level. So most studies have really focused at the school level. What strategies can we uh, put in place to improve teaching, to improve learning outcomes at that level? But then there's really been a gap at uh, the subnational level. And that is where I think UNESCO now is calling it the missing middle. That is the middle tier. Yet, um, with the decentralization reforms, we find that um, it's decentralized from the central government to the province or zonal, like you call it here. In Uganda, we call it districts. Before now, we reach the school level. So what is happening at that subnational level is that we are empowering them or giving them the authority to manage the uh, education services or service delivery within their jurisdiction. But then are they really empowered? Do they have all the resources they need in order to plan effectively, in order to ensure that these services are being delivered effectively at the school level? So, um, and of course, as we decentralize, we need to, the, of course, most governments have really um, ensured that as we decentralize, we don't decentralize everything. The central level most of the time has controlled, for example, setting the curriculum. This is standardized and it's at national level. Distributing, um, printing and distribution of textbooks. This is at national level. So, and even setting standards of how many learners should be in a specific, in a, in a given classroom. How many teachers should be uh, teaching in a school maybe over 1,000 learners, so that pupil-teacher ratio, pupil-desk ratio, all these standards are set at, at a national level, but also informed by global standards. But then at the, at the district level, then we have the district translating these standards from the central level, these policies, down to the district level and ensuring that these policies are implemented. So the middle tier is really, really important and relevant in translating policies from the central level into practice at the school level. And of course, they also relay information from the school level down up to the central level to inform policies. So in all that, and given that uh, these have really been um, uh, forgotten, as we talk about the education data challenge, I think we shall be sharing more in these five days. Like uh, I think Sophia had earlier I highlighted some of the key puzzling you know, figures. We have over 600 million children that are not really learning. They are not achieving the minimum proficiency levels. So this has been coined as the learning crisis. But we want to believe that behind this learning crisis, there is also a data crisis. And this um, has been highlighted by the GPE kicks. Why? Because um, most studies that have been done around, they found that, um, like Nelly was talking about, it has been top down or data coming from the school level to inform uh, central level planning. And this data has been, you know, delayed. We have long periods of collecting data. It's not timely, so it's not going to inform timely decision making. All the, all the data that is available now that is shared in form of statistical yearbooks will be less relevant at the district level because they will not be able to drill down to understand where is that problem and how can we address this. Then we've talked about the silos, different departments within the ministries themselves have different systems that are not talking to each other. So then how do we harmonize this data so that we have a comprehensive view of how this data is really um, informing our decision making. So, and then we have the COVID that came up really. And I think it was kind of like a wake up call for us to see how do we make sure that we build resilient education systems that are able to withstand these, these shocks. So, um, and talking about reporting, uh, this was a report from the UNESCO um, UIS uh, data bank and it only indicated that between 2020 and 2018 only 35 percent of the countries reported on the most important sdg for global indicators so if we are having 
close to you know, 65% of countries not reporting. So if they are not reporting, are they actually using data in their decision making? So building on those, um, um, on that, in Uganda we tried to see, uh, we came into the education sector, of course having supported the health sector for more than 10 years to implement DHIS2 for education. And like we've been discussing, it's beyond the technology, it's about the enabling environment that is around this technology. It's about the social cultural factors and aspects that are really influencing this technology and making it work. So learning from health, this is um, one of the papers that we have written, and uh, this is just drawing some key lessons from health. When we looked at health, when they were adopting DHIS2, they established a national health policy. So looking at our education sector, we asked, is there an education management policy or what they usually term as an EMIS policy? Because this policy is very important. It will uh, guide on how data is collected, on how it's disseminated, on how it should be used. So it really builds together and ensures that there is timely in reporting data, in disseminating this data. And um, so it's very important that we have policies in place to guide the data management uh, processes and also the use of this data. Then the other key learning from health was um, the stakeholders. We have so many stakeholders, both in health and education. We have education development partners supporting all this. But you find many times that these partners, each one of them has their own system, implementing their own system in a specific zone or district, and this is not linked to the national system. So what they did in health when they were adopting DHIS2, they really tried to align and bring all these partners together because we 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 appreciate that you know um, in the countries like developing countries like Uganda where I'm coming from you find that uh, we have limited resources even the partner resources are not enough so instead of having these resources in silos we want to optimize these resources so in health they formed a technical working group that brings all the partners on one platform they plan together they allocate resources together and this was a key learning that we had in order to implement in education because we found that we could leverage on these partners in the education sector. The other thing is about harmonization of tools. As we have um, different partners coming on board and the ministry and there are different departments, each one of them has their own tool, data collection tool. But then all these tools you may find bare minimum each one of them is collecting enrollment numbers. Do we need 10 tools collecting enrollment numbers? No. So if we harmonize these tools and enabled by, the, by this technical working group, we could ensure that we reduce the data collection burden down at the school level. You know, the schools are really fatigued having like five partners going to school collecting more or less the same data. Why not have one tool? And that was um, a learning from health because all the tools are, are harmonized and there is periodic and coordinated review of these tools. So learning that we went and developed an integrated timely data collection tool that has become our use case in the education sector. Then the other thing we, we recognized was that um, there was no dedicated um, subnational level manage, data manager in the education sector. Whereas in health there was one and that was um, institutionalized during the after the introduction of DHIS2. So these managers are really relevant and important because they will manage the data and inform you know the other managers. Uh, these data managers will ensure that the data is collected on time, it's analyzed, it's validated, they will coordinate all the data processes and then they can extract this data to inform decision making and alleviate um, the other uh, top managers from these uh, data management roles. Lastly, the other thing we talked about and that has been mentioned really about the power of the network and um, ability to build a capacity 
a comprehensive capacity building uh, framework within the implementation of this system. It's one thing introducing the system and training only, you know, having a few trainings. I think the capacity building has to be long term. So within health, uh, we have uh, in Uganda, we also have the health informatics course. It's a master's course. And this is being undertaken by um, health managers, district managers to inform them of this data management practices. And of course, we have the regional DHIS2 academies, in-country national academies. So these are really, really relevant for us to continue updating ourselves on the relevance and how to use this data. So um, taking those learnings that um, from health, that, that's really what informed our establishment of the education district of excellence. We went through the whole process of how do we bring these stakeholders together? How do we understand that data needs both at the central level and at the district level? We, formed, uh, we created that integrated timely tool. Then of course we equipped the districts with infrastructure. We gave them laptops. Uh, computers, um, internet, printers, so that they could print their charts and, you know, visualize them on the, on the notes boards. And then we built capacity to ensure that they, they know how to use the data. This was uh, the timely tool that is going to be shared. I think a demo is coming up later. So this, that is the integrated timely tool. It was customized into DHIS2, and it has different sections, talking about different components, enrollment, dropout, infrastructure, special needs. So all this informs the different departments and also at the district level. So from this implementation, we really see that um, through the district of excellence model we've tried i can't say that we have empowered but we are in the process of of empowering this missing middle why because they now have the ownership of their data they can control it they can capture their data they can analyze it and extract it this picture there is uh, for a district education officer in one of the districts and she was explaining how she's using her data and of course given that we've decentralized the data management it has improved the quality of data that is being collected because they have the knowledge of their districts they know that a certain school cannot report a thousand learners so they are able to quickly validate this data and decision making really not right now is not um, driven by any other ambitions or uh, or influenced by politicians but rather it's really influenced by the data they are collecting and this is just to highlight some of the, uh, the impact of this um, implementation in the districts we are in. Data has really been used for decision making, for planning and budgeting. Which are the key roles of this middle tier to support education service delivery? So allocation of desks, allocation of books, construction of classrooms has really been informed by the data. And then the other use case we've had was about, you know, strengthening the health and education um, synergies between the health and education sector. We all know that our learners are the denominator or, you know, they provide the denominator for immunization targets for the health sector. So how do we make sure that they are talking to each other? So in the Local government, we have both health and education departments, but these departments before introduction of DHIS2, we are not talking to each other. But now both departments have the system and education can easily, you know, extract the data that is specific to inform these immunization targets. And we have these use cases in measles, um, human papilloma virus vaccination, deworming in uh, early childhood uh, schools. And then the other thing that um, we've had is that if you can see to the, to the left, yeah, extreme left, uh, this data has really informed uh, learner dropouts, yes, mitigating the learner dropouts. How? Because from the system, I, I, and actually it was because of COVID, the impact of uh, COVID led to Teenage pregnancies, so many teenage pregnancies, 
learners dropping out of school. But then we had this program of how do we accelerate re-entry of these learners back to school. So from the system we have the data, we know the locations these learners are most and we are able to reach out to them and engage the community and ensure that these learners are returned to school. That picture down there really, really talks to me. Why? Because it's for a district inspector of schools seated with the parents and children um, in the community and really trying to talk to them about the relevance of having their children return to school. So this was really informed by the power of this data and the districts being able to visualize that in the darkest spot in one of the sub-counties, this is where these learners were. Then, of course, I talked about construction of classrooms, distribution of uh, scholastic materials, which schools are not licensed, especially the private schools, which ones need to be licensed. And in a decentralized model like in Uganda, you find that even partners will will um, bypass the central level and have memorandum of understanding with the district level. But how do we ensure that these partner initiatives and implementations are actually informed by the data? So this has really, really been very um, helpful. So lastly, I, and I think uh, the Honorable State Minister also talked about it, the technology, yes, but we need to understand the social cultural um, aspects, the social aspects of the social technical of this system. And um, my colleague CD and I are writing a paper on the enablers or you know, drivers of education data use. We are drawing insights from the two country implementations. And one of the things really that we've recognized from this implementation is that there are some factors beyond the technology, such as, you know, motivation. If you don't have passionate, you know, motivated staff at the district level, or at the school level, then you could have a very nice system, but it will not be used. So what is motivating these people to, you know, use this data? We need to understand that and make sure that we keep it alive. Then we have some organizational factors. You know, the routines. Are you having meetings, district meetings with the between the districts and the schools, these routines that have been established of really discussing data or having these conversations around data will promote the use of the data. Then the other thing, of course, is about the structure. We could design the system, but if you don't have a data manager within the administrative structure, then who is going to manage that data? Who is going to manage that system? And of course, we understand that the you know, the other district managers have other administrative roles. They have a queue of teachers that is waiting up for them to, you know, attend to their administrative challenges. So we need to relieve them of this data management and focus it maybe to the data manager, but also train everyone so that at least they can always be able to extract this data and use it whenever they, 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 dis they want to use it. Then lastly, we found that uh, leadership really played a key role. This is at sub-national level. So where we had result-oriented sub-national level managers were really driving this. So what is driving all this? Um, if you have you know, leaders that are not passionate about the data, then they will not drive the team towards that um, data use culture. So, and also forming you know, open communication and fora around discussing data, opening up WhatsApp groups. In Uganda, we have WhatsApp groups for every cluster of schools. And this is a platform where we could share and discuss more about data and how it can be used. So those are some of the learnings and reflections we are uh, getting from the, from the field where we are implementing, but it's also informing our research and also having to document this and make them as recommendations to practice. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monica. And um, I, because of our time, we're going to be a little bit agile, as, um, as uh, Pamud mentioned earlier. So 
we are going to hear from the voice of school principals and the provincial education officers. So if I can invite Dr. Pamud um, up to the stage just to introduce, and then we will be breaking for lunch. I must also say, please, the KICS community online, please do feel free to um, ask your questions in the chat and we can take that after the lunch as well. Right. Um, I think uh, in, even in Monica's presentation, it was very obvious, right? So all the data that we are talking about is uh, not directly generated from uh, provincial or like a sub-national level. It is actually de generating from the lowest level in our hierarchy, which is a school. It is, even though it is, a, it is at the lowest level in the hierarchy, I would say that is the most important level, right? Because that's where all our operations takes place. That's where the students learn and that's where the teachers teach. So uh, we are now going to have a panel uh, to discuss more about challenges and what is actually happening with data at school and the provincial level. So uh, uh, to be on the pan panel, it is my privilege to invite uh, the following dignitaries. Uh, Dr. Sumeda Jayavira, principal of uh, Sirimao Bandaranaika Vidyalaya, Kalambu 7, Sri Lanka. Mrs. Manomi Senaviratna, Principal of Visaka Vidyalaya. Mr. Sampat Veragoda, the Principal of DS Senanayaka College, Colombo. And representing the provincial level, we have Mr. Ansaf Taus, Deputy Director Planning from Sabragamur Province. And Ms. K. M. Prabhani, Deputy Director Planning from Southern Province. And to moderate the panel, let me also invite Mr. Gasita Arbevadna, Deputy Director, Data Management from the Ministry of uh, Education, Sri Lanka. So let me, all, uh, let me invite all of you to please come forward and uh, Mr. Gasita to come forward to moderate the panel. 